With the fifth commandment, we turn our attention to the expression of God's will and character with respect to our horizontal relationships with one another. Uh, importantly, the second table of the law, as it has been called, begins with the intimate relationships within the family, uh, though we will see that the fifth commandment certainly has bearing on more than just the family relationships. Now, our approach to this commandment will be to look at that progressively broader way in which the commandment applies and has bearing on our relationships. We'll begin with the narrower focus on the honor required towards parents and then broaden out uh, to the body of Christ and finally to all of our relations. So to begin, we're going to consider how Jesus understood the impact of the fifth commandment as he engaged the Pharisees in his public ministry. We're going to consider briefly Matthew chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. Those verses say, For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. Now, the context for these verses is Jesus' condemnation of the traditions of men, uh, particularly those that displayed no regard for the word of God. This specific example of pitting the traditions of man against the fifth commandment highlighted the gravity of neglecting the honor and duty required of children to their parents. Now, one implication of this use of the fifth commandment here by Jesus is that its force endures, endures even when mother and father are in their old age. Paul himself expresses this idea in 1 Timothy as well, highlighting the importance of children honoring their parents by caring for those parents physically and financially, particularly widows is, is what he has in mind, but more broadly as well, even into their old age. Thus, even a surface-level understanding of the fifth commandment requires us to think broadly about how we honor uh, parents throughout our life, not only as we are young children, but even as we are adults. But we can say more about the extent of this commandment's bearing on our horizontal relationships, and we see this in First Peter. First Peter chapter 2, verse 17 says, Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Here in Peter's first letter, he makes a compact yet profound statement that broadens the application of the fifth commandment beyond the bounds of our familial relationships. Note the structure of this brief verse here. It has four parts, and it's in what's called a chiastic pattern. That is to say that the first and the fourth parts are related, while the second and the third phrases, so the inner and out, the inner uh, parts are related, the outer parts are connected as well. In this pattern, the verse broadens out the application of the fifth commandment. This opening call to honor everyone, whether superior, inferior, or equal, uh, exceeds the family relationships. However, the structure of this verse also acknowledges the increased importance of expressing the fullness of this application within the community of faith. Of course, this doesn't exclude love for neighbor outside of the body of Christ, but it, what, what it does do is uh, demonstrate the importance of showing honor to superior, inferior, and equal, uh, particularly within the body of Christ, the brotherhood, as Peter says it here. Honor everyone, but love the body of Christ, you could say. Now, Paul adds to what Peter says in this verse in Romans chapter 12. Uh, pick, picking up on this idea of the brotherly love, Romans 12.10, he says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Here Paul begins from a similar foundation, and he sets up a kind of competition between believers when it comes to fulfilling the fifth commandment within the body of Christ. Given the broader understanding of honor being due to not only mother and father, but then to everyone, that is, superiors, inferiors, and equals, the effect of Paul's words here of, of outdoing one another and showing honor, particularly within the body of Christ, <clears throat> is that if, if we were consistently practicing this in the church, it would be the end of public calls to service to one another. And that's because everyone would be doing, or would be looking for ways, in a competitive sense, 
to show honor to superiors, inferiors, and equals, to honor mother and father, as it were, so that needs would be anticipated and addressed uh, before and apart from public pleas for help. Such is the ideal of the Christian community to which we ought to strive. If honor abounded in a Romans 12 kind of way, we might even realize even more uh, the reasons annexed to the fifth commandment, as the catechism puts it, the promise of long life and prosperity as far as it shall serve for God's glory and and our own good to all such as keep this commandment. Finally, Peter's exhortation to honor everyone extends beyond the body of Christ, of course. And Paul himself includes such teaching elsewhere, uh, especially in Romans chapter 13. Just picking out one of those verses, Paul says, Romans chapter 13, verse 7, And pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Again, broadening even further this discussion of the fifth commandment out beyond the body of Christ and using the civil government, which is the the immediate context of Romans 13, 1 through 7. As the example here, Paul in the first part of Romans 13 reminds his readers that, uh, first of all, uh, to, to set the context of this particular verse, that the civil authorities, 13, Romans 13, 1, uh, and through, through 7, have authority because God has instituted those, authority, those civil authorities. And then to conclude that thought of, of the authority of civil governments, he ends with this strong summary statement that reflects a broad application of the fifth commandment in light of the fact uh, that we owe honor to superiors, inferiors, and equals within uh, the broader relations of uh, state and and in the world. And so he says, uh, uh, pay respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And in in essence, he leaves no room uh, for excluding anyone from the application of the fifth commandment, therefore. Now, while we might be inclined to squirm at a strong presentation of honoring and respecting and even in the earlier verses of Romans 13, submitting to civil authorities, I'm personally convinced that most of us need this push to think about submission to the civil authorities as an application of the fifth commandment more than we need to quote Peter when he says we must obey God rather than men. After all, This is part of what it means to honor father and mother, and there is a blessing uh, for honoring and submitting not only to the familiar relations and uh, mutual relations in the church, but also in the world. All that said, and the encouragement to honor uh, even the civil authorities and relations outside of the church, I will end here with an extended quote from Don Carson's commentary on Romans that provides some some balance and perspective to how this fifth commandment can be applied in the civil realm. Carson says, Balance is needed. On the one hand, we must not obscure the teaching of Romans 13, 1 through 7 in a flood of qualification. Paul makes clear that government is ordained by God, indeed that every particular governmental authority is ordained by God, and that the Christian must recognize and respond to this fact with an attitude of submission. Hence, this is, to add to what Carson says, a one application of the fifth commandment. Then he continues, Government is more than a nuisance to be put up with. It is an institution established by God to accomplish some of his purposes on earth. Hence, verses 3 and 4 of Romans 13. On the other hand, Carson continues, we must not read Romans 13, 1 through 7 out of its broad New Testament context and put government in a position relative to the Christian that only God can hold. Christians should give thanks for government as an institution of God. We should pray regularly for our leaders, hence 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, and we should be prepared to follow the orders of our government. We should, but we should also refuse to give to government any absolute rights and should evaluate all its demands in the light of the gospel. That balance then helps us to say that the fifth commandment uh, has a broad application that is circumscribed, however, by our ultimate duty to honor, fear, and love God above all else. 
And so as we uh, consider this uh, commandment, uh, we see that it has uh, broad application beyond the family relations, but also within the relations of the body of Christ and even in the world, using the civil government as the example there, that we honor, we uh, even submit, we offer submission to uh, superiors, and we honor inferiors and equals. Now we can go to some uh, discussion questions to advance this conversation. First of all, what are some ways that we can honor our parents when we are all, parents and children alike, adults, but our parents don't need physical or financial help yet? Second, what are some ways we can outdo one another in showing honor within this congregation and therefore um, fulfill the fifth commandment? And finally, how can you balance the application of the fifth commandment with unreasonably demanding superiors, inferiors, or equals? Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, your word. I thank you, God, that you uh, challenge us to uh, consider how we can outdo one another in showing honor, not only within the body of Christ, but also in our relations uh, in the world. Lord, I pray that you would uh, give us the grace to do so and that you would be glorified in it. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.